Thank you all for coming. Uh, Rick's having a family reunion over here, by the way, if anybody hasn't noticed. <laughs> Angela, did you push record? I did. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. All right, let me get out of my way a little bit here. Well, thanks for coming. Um, this is the uh, head branch of the Ontario Theological Society, and we welcome you. Um, I think I was supposed to put the May meeting, not April, sorry. Um, <laughs> time, is, time is getting away too fast for me. But welcome. Thank you all for coming. Um, we do record our meetings. We have a, um, a lot of members who don't live close by, so they actually go to our YouTube channel afterwards and they can re-watch it. Or, you know, if Rick gives you some really good information or websites and you want to go back and just check that again, you can go to our web, YouTube channel and, and re-watch it. Here. So, as I said, we're the uh, branch of the Ontario Genealogical Society. Um, OGS has been preserving family history for over 50 years. There's branches all across Ontario. They're the largest ge genealogical society in Canada. And we are the Kent branch, so we mainly focus on Kent County research. Um, we have a family history library. We do mentoring and assistance. We have a newsletter, a great Facebook group, a website, uh, monthly presentations just like this. Um, we have a fantastic resource library of our own. Um, it's in the second, on the second floor at the Chatham Kent Public Library. It's open from Wednesday, Wednesday to Saturday, one to five. And there is a wealth of information there. So if you've never been up, definitely stop by and uh, check it out. Um, this is our Kent Branch website. Email us if you have any questions or would like to know any, any other information. And we also have a great Facebook group that's very, very active. Um, a few upcoming events. Um, on Monday night, this Monday coming up, the Essex Branch, which is located in Windsor, um, their presentation is the Fille du Roi, um, the King's Daughters. And they're how, they have their meetings at the Windsor Public Library. Um, and chances are there's going to be a few of us from Chatham going. So if anybody's interested, just talk to me afterwards. And we can uh, carpool if you're interested. The Kent Historical Society is having their meeting um, May 21st. And Stan Yor, uh, most people know him. He's a historian and uh, a, a classic car. He's passionate about classic cars. He's quite often talks about the Grey Dorks. Um, he's going to be giving a presentation about the Chatham car. Don't know what that is. We'll have to go and see. Their meetings are held at the Cultural Center in Studio One. <coughs> And then our next few upcoming meetings, uh, June 14th, we'll be discussing the checks in Kent County. Um, and then September 13th, the French presence in the Detroit River, very early French. Um, so we're looking forward to these two presentations. They're very um, delving into some different um, nationalities um, and connections. So definitely join us if, you, if you're able to. Um, the Essex branch is also holding a, uh, a trip, a field trip, to the Burton Collection at the Detroit Public Library. The Burton Collection has tons of information and great resources for Kent and Essex folks, the very early, um, because the borders, they used to go back and forth across the border. Um, we are going to be having a little a personal tour of the collection and a little presentation. Um, they're going to be um, carpooling out of Windsor, so if you would like to get your name on that list or if you need any more information or you're interested in going, just email the Essex branch at the, um, the email there. And each year, OGS holds a annual conference and family history show. And this year it's being held in London, Ontario. So it's only an hour down the road. So it's a great opportunity that if you're thinking of getting into family history, or you're just dabbling, or you're, whether you're a seasoned genealogist, there's something there for everybody. Okay, that's uh, June 21st and the 23rd. And the website's there, you can go there and check it out and see if there's anything that you're interested. Um, the Marketplace is a great um, opportunity just to go for the day, it's free. Um, there's great vendors are gonna be there. Ancestry's gonna be there, My Heritage is gonna be there. Find My Pass is going to be there, we have the Tree Maker, there's all kinds of different vendors that are available in Marketplace that you could go and talk to. So that's a, that's a good patron. All right, so we have a little bit of news ourselves. So we applied for the summer, uh, for a summer student, um, summer student jobs program and we were accepted. 
so we had a summer student last year through the, the summer jobs program and we also are going to be doing it again this year so if you're up in our library and you see a new person that'll be our summer student we've been approved for nine nine weeks so chances are we'll have them continuing on with some of the digitization program programs that we were doing last year we also applied for the South Kent um, Wind and Community Fund. Sorry, I got a dry throat. Um, and this this one we applied for um, money to upgrade all of our um, laptops and computers and our scanners because of all the great work we've been doing digitizing. They're starting to get worn out, so we're really hoping that this grant comes through. We will know May 30th if it does. And then in September, we're going to be co-hosting the third annual um, Family History Fair with the Chatham Kent Public Library. We've done that two years in a row now, and it was very, very successful. There'll be more information coming down the road. And thanks to Linda Patterson, our publicity person, um, we had a little interview with uh, Your TV, the Chatham Cable Channel. So we had an opportunity to meet with um, the host and to have a sit down and just talk about who we are, a little bit about genealogy, getting started in family history. So it should be out probably in a few weeks and we'll let people know. I personally don't have cable, so I'm hoping I can just go <laughs> crash at someone's house and have a tea and watch it. <laughs> um, and then also we have um, some sad news of a, a long, long time member who passed away lately. And that was Jane. So we just thought we wanted to, you know, show some respect for remembering her. Okay. <laughs> Um, so next presentation, Rick has been visiting us up at the Chatham Kent Public Library in our family history room for the last year or so, and um, he was alluding to the fact that he was trying to research information to prove his UEL, um, which was very exciting, and I think we always harassed him and said, tell us what you've learned, tell us what you've done. So finally, um, I think we talked him into coming and sharing with us what he found where he found it and how he's applied it. So Rick, if you don't mind, come on up and we'll get things going for you. <laughs> Thank you, Cindy. And, uh, yes. Okay. So uh, as she says, I'm going to talk about the various methods I've used to track down certain branches of my family tree. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, we'll start with a bit of a disclaimer. Uh, I've only been doing this for a couple of years. So those of you who have been at it for decades, I'm a rookie. And I certainly am no expert in genealogy. I'll be talking about the McKinnons, which at one time were a Scottish clan. And just because one has ancestors named McKinnon does not necessarily mean that you're related to those McKinnons. It has to be proven. I haven't done that yet. I'm fortunate to have a number of prominent people in my past because prominent people leave better paper trails. So it's been easier for me. Uh, my methods may not be as effective for you. Uh, and in the course of my presentation, if I say something you know to be wrong, just shout out and say, Rick, you're full of it. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> and, and I won't, uh, I won't do anything bad to you. <laughs> Otherwise, please hold your questions to the end. Thank you all for attending. Let's get going here. I'm going to talk about who I am, the family lore, uh, the things I was told as a kid. I'm going to talk about the factory line. I'm going to talk about the United Empire Loyalists that uh, <laughs> my uh, umpteen times great grandparents. And I'm going to talk about the McKinnons. Then, uh, if there's time at the end, uh, we'll go over some websites and have wrap up and questions. Albert Lyle Thackeray. He's a news editor for CSCO Radio, Traffic Cop, Justice of the Peace court recorder for Magistrate Ivan B. Craig, Windsor Star reporter, photographer, and bureau chief, president of the Kent County Model Railroading Society, scouting district commissioner, and president of the Wallaceburg Historical Society. He was also my father. 
Victor Lauriston, who most of you are familiar with, wrote such books as Romantic Kent, has an illustrious career in Kent County. He was a cousin of mine. And my family over here, everything I say for me applies to them as well. <laughs> so, uh, Garnet Roy Newkirk, mayor of Chatham for 13 years, also my cousin. Dr. Samuel David Radley, physicist and pharmacist, public school board trustee and alderman, who is my great great grandfather. William Webster Thackeray was uh, my great uncle. He helped repel the uh, Fenians at Niagara Falls. He uh, moved to Montana and became a wealthy and prominent uh, businessman and alderman. And as I said, he was my great uncle. He was given a grant of land up in the Cochrane District for his efforts in helping to repel the Fenians. And this is what my mother told me. This is family lore. She said, you come from good stock. <laughs> <laughs> she was telling me that I came uh, home from school in grade 10. I had a, a lousy report card. And she was a bit upset. <clears throat> she said, uh, you come from good stock. You're related to William Makepeace Thackeray, the author. You're related to the Radleys and the Parks. Victor Lauriston was born William Edward Park. Because John Bell Thackeray married Mary Ellen Newkirk, they were related to some of the pioneers of Kent County, the Newkirks and the Dolsons. At that time, I didn't know who or what a Dolson was. <laughs> You're a McKinnon and related to Scottish kings. Donald McKinnon came from up near Toronto. And he was a bad man, and he uh, abandoned my uh, grandmother and great-grandmother. And she said no one ever knew what became of him, so tracing him down was a bit of a challenge. <laughs> we'll get into that. <laughs> and when I was in school, grade six, we studied the United Empire Loyalists, and my teacher uh, singled me out and said, uh, I think you in particular have some Loyalist ancestors. Of course, I had no idea really what he was talking about. <laughs> Amazing how things change when you get older. <laughs> Let's talk about the factories, how newspapers and some online searching help lead to an author. Uh, when I first started this, I uh, was relying solely on the family trees in Ancestry.ca, yeah. and I was blindly following the hints. And before I knew it, I was a two-door, a steward, and a plantagenet. <laughs> and uh, it, was a, it was a rookie mistake. I was brand new, and no one said, don't follow these hints. So anyhow, I got stuck very quickly. Some trees were uh, trying to trace uh, my family line back to the author. They said we were related to uh, the author's grandfather. And then finally, out of desperation, I contacted the archives people in Wakefield, Yorkshire, England, and paid them some money. And they sent me back what, all, what I'd already found on Ancestry. So yeah. I don't advise calling the professionals in. I, it took me a while to learn that lesson, because later on I called even more powerful professionals in that cost a lot more money and, and got uh, fruitless results. So. This, this hobby takes time and you need to be patient and only call in the uh, professionals as a very last resort because they are expensive. Um, then I started seeing some Thackeray names in the Kent County census record. I was ignoring them because I didn't think they were part of uh, my Thackeray line. Then. Uh, I was seeing names like Francis Thackeray and Bell Thackeray, which particularly caught my interest because I knew I had uh, a great grandfather named John Bell Thackeray. So I went on to Ancestry and I uh, did a search. And uh, I will try and uh, duplicate that search for you just to uh, show you how it helped me out.
So do a search. All collections. When I searched for, I saw the name of one of Francis Thackeray's children as Mary. So, and uh, I put her birth year as uh, 1845, plus or minus five years, and we did a search. And we come down to this wonderful looking old lady whose name uh, is Mary Thackeray. And I came across this story. Mary Thackeray was born in Garton, England, March 13, 1845 and died in Grinnell, Iowa. She was the daughter of Frances Thackeray. Family came to America, locating in Chatham, Canada. And I had my connection. I now knew that my Thackeray line had come from Garton and the Wolves, England. Or at least I strongly suspected it. So, we will, uh, Come out of here and go back to the presentation. So then I searched the, uh, the Ontario uh, Name Index database at the uh, OGS site uh, website. Uh, That's the Ontario Genealogical website, and. Here's where you can search for your ancestors' names. And up comes they're having some performance issues at the OGS site lately, so hopefully this doesn't take too long. There we go. And there's a bunch of factories, but any of these that say image three all trace back to and here uh, here we have Bell Thackeray, we have uh, an Elizabeth, we have an Esther, we have a Francis. They all trace back to uh, A family history document stored at the Toronto Reference Library. It's the family record of William Sharp. And uh, William Sharp and Jane Thackeray married in Garton, England uh, in the 18th century, then came to Canada. And uh, Jane Thackeray was the youngest of uh, 10 children, of which uh, my great great grandfather, William Thackeray, Francis Thackeray and Bell Thackeray, who I've been talking about, were all siblings of. So I now had a family, and I had them located in England, and then it was a simple matter to uh, connect the dots to the author using uh, ancestry, uh, birth and death and marriage records. And uh, uh, and as I say, I have connected the dots to William Bates <coughs> Thackeray. I need some conclusive paper, uh, which uh, I would probably uh, have to go to England to find, but I have plenty of circumstantial evidence that uh, I am related to William H. B. Thackeray. 
This was in this uh, family history book at the Toronto Reference Library. It's got the names and birth dates of all ten of the children. And it's almost like it's uh, a Rosetta Stone. <laughs> you don't come up with this too often. So my circumstantial evidence as a child, I was told, I was always told I was related to him. The Anaconda, Montana, Montana newspaper stated William Webster Thackeray was a cousin twice removed. The Park family records, this is Victor Lauriston stuff, prepared uh, by Beatrice Park state John Bell Thackeray is a cousin, the Grinnell, Iowa Herald, the obituary record for Mary Stickle, who was born in Thackeray, says she's a second cousin. So this makes me a fourth cousin four times removed, so I'm not going to be pounding on publisher's doors for royalties anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the Anaconda Standard right at the bottom, W.W. Thackeray, your cousin twice removed from the great novelist, is running a restaurant at Yanty in the state. There's <coughs> Petra Sonora Park, they, they uh, had some memoirs on the Thackeray's because uh, her mother, uh, yes, her uh, grandmother was a factory, so. Um, and it says uh, he had a cousin, William McPeace Factory of London, England, and it goes on. And here's this record we were looking for Mary Stickle on ancestry. Uh, and right at the bottom it says it is a matter of much interest to all to learn that Mrs. Stickle was the second cousin of William McPeace Thackeray, the famous English author. So that's about enough for me to say that, yeah, it's not a, a close relationship, but it's there. So, and then just a bit on uh, my great-great-grandfather, William M. Thackeray. I have no idea what the M stands for. It's how it's written on his death certificate. But, he uh, got married in Centerville, Michigan in 1836. He bought lot uh, 86 up here uh, at the west end of town. And he lived right beside uh, Cornelius Newkirk. Cornelius, that Cornelius Newkirk was born in Marbletown, New York. So that's, keep that in mind, that's an uh, interesting connection later on. So from 1840 to 1842, he was a county uh, coroner in St. Joseph County. That's in the history of St. Joseph County. He moved to Chatham in 1842. He was a saddler, a cabinet maker, furniture dealer, and finally a farmer. He's one of the first leaders of the Park Street Church Choir, and he played the organ. He farmed lot 15, concession six is Raleigh Township. He had two brothers and seven sisters. There's his marriage record. That comes from Family Search. May 1st, 1836, he married Ann Brown. This newspaper article was uh, one of the first articles my father put into the Windsor Star when he became a reporter photographer. And it's uh, talking about the uh, Park Street United Church. And it says, uh, one of the earliest choir leaders of the church is William Thackeray, great grandfather of this reporter. I thought that was kind of neat. And this is where they lived in Raleigh Township, uh, lot uh, 15, concession six. Up here is Peter James Newkirk. John Bell Newkirk uh, lived pretty close to the lady he was going to marry. So. And what was rural England like in 1836 to cause people to immigrate to Canada? The enclosure system was going in vogue. This is where uh, wealthy aristocrats were petitioning Parliament to grant them huge tracts of land. And they would enclose them and get the people to work the land and pay the people money. So the average person had no hope of ever owning their own land. Uh, most people were agricultural laborers. The, uh, the census record for uh, the father of these 10 children uh, says he was an ag lab, which is short for agricultural laborer. 
The cities were rife with poverty, as described by Charles Dickens, and but rural people were still flocking to them. English government was offering incentives for people to move to the colonies, give them enough money to pay for their uh, ship passage and uh, buy some land in the New World. That's very likely why uh, four of those ten factory children came to North America. Because they, they would harvest uh, as a community. Uh, and the, uh, the landowner would get the money for the crops and pay these people a pittance wage. Mm -hmm. St. Joseph's County, Michigan, 1836. The Erie Canal was completed in 1825, so it was reasonably easy to get to Centerville, Michigan, St. Joseph County. There was a road from Detroit to Chicago, and there was a railroad that passed through White Pigeon. St. Joseph County, uh, accounted for the second highest volume of land sales in Michigan in the mid-1830s. And White Pigeon had the land registry office for the county as a historical building and still stands today. Much of the land was bought by speculators at the rate of $1.25 per acre for 80 acre plots, so 100 bucks bought you 80 acres. And then they would sell it at a premium. Now we move on to the Loyalists of Raleigh Township. And land record, which are all three of Canada, uh, land petition records, a Christian newspaper, and a Kent branch member helped prove Loyalist descent. Samuel Newkirk was relatively easy to prove. I was told I was related to the Newkirk <coughs> family of the John Bell Factory, Mary Ellen Newkirk marriage of 1868 and family records helped confirm this. Mary Ellen's death certificate gave the connection to her father, an Indian, and to his father, Jane. I found all these on Ancestry. And then the link to Samuel Newkirk is in James's Upper Canada Land Petition. So uh, I think um, in the interest of time, I may skip uh, Pardon? You're good. I'm good? Well, in yeah. the interest of time, then we'll go to uh, <coughs> this particular site. <coughs> this is where you search for the land petitions. And you put in a surname like Newkirk. And you give a name James. And you search. And there was two James Newkirks, one up in Niagara and one in Raleigh Township. So uh, we see that uh, James's land petitions were on microfilm reel C2481 and, uh, and uh, all this information and uh, how to obtain copies. You can go right to where the microfilms are available online. Twenty-four eighty-one is right here, and I happen to know because I've been here plenty of times that uh, James Newkirk's land petitions start here. And we have the petition of James Newkirk of Raleigh Township in the Western District. Yeoman. They always sign themselves as yeoman. A yeoman is a uh, a landowner that's uh, le lower in status than a gentleman. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I had no gentlemen, uh, and they were all yeomen. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, this is how you uh, get to and look for. Uh, I, I made this look easy, but. Uh, Finding where each petition is in the on the reel takes a bit of time because it's a hit or miss. So when you do find them, make sure you record the numbers of the images because if you ever have to go back or if you want to 
copy him down. But anyhow, this petition talks about how his late father was a member of Butler's Rangers and had been killed before he made the uh, United Empire Loyalist list. And uh, could they add him to the list? And uh, it's funny because I found Samuel Newkirk on the UE list of the land boards for Hess County all over the place. But so I guess somehow that information never made its way to the Executive Council. Once the land boards were abolished and the Executive Council took over the task of divvying out the land. the least bit nervous, no. <laughs> Anyhow, that's how you go and search for land petition records, uh, and I have found a ton of information through, if you're willing to spend the time and go through these, they, you get all kinds of data. So, my wonderful cousin over here provided me with this document that shows that John Bell Factory and Mary Ellen Newkirk were married, and that's their children and who their children married. So this is family memorabilia. The first thing, as I said, you need to do is reach out to family, see what they can give. And I was very fortunate. I got a bunch of wonderful stuff back from my family. And here's their uh, marriage record, circled in red. They got married in Detroit. Mm -hmm. well, I really don't know why that is, other than maybe uh, John Bell was born in the United States, but he'd been in Canada for quite a while by then, so maybe uh, Minion Newkirk wasn't happy with who his daughter was marrying, but he just lived down the road. But I have no idea why. Here's Mary Ellen's death certificate. Say her father was Ninian Newkirk. Here's Ninian Newkirk's death certificate. Say his parents were James Newkirk and Mary Dolson. We had a heck of a time finding Mary Dolson. There's excerpts from uh, James Newkirk's petition. Talks about his father being a loyalist and that's Samuel Newkirk's discharge papers uh, written up by Colonel John Butler, who uh, ran Butler's Rangers, which uh, Samuel Newkirk was part of William Caldwell's company at Butler's Rangers. And here uh, is a, a letter written by Isaac Dolson. If you remember, I said I didn't know who or what a Dolson was. And here, uh, Isaac Dolson was my five times great grandfather, as it turns out. And he said uh, he was personally present on the 26th of September, 1788, when Commodore Grant married Samuel Newkirk and Elizabeth Brown. Commodore Grant ran the naval yards of Detroit. And uh, he was a little later, uh, about 1786, uh, made a justice of the peace. And he was also a member of the uh, Hess Land Board. So Commodore Grant was quite familiar with Samuel Newkirk and vice versa. And it's interesting that Isaac Dolson was there because this pinpoints these people to being around Detroit in 1788. Because that's where Commodore Alexander Grant uh, worked out. And the end result, my certificate for Samuel Newker. So the folks around the table, you're eligible for this too, if you ever want one. Proving Isaac Dolson and George Field. Many in Newkirk's death certificate stated that Mary Dolson was uh, his mother and James Newkirk his father. As I said, finding Mary Dolson was a challenge. Isaac Dolson had a daughter named Mary, but she would have been 10 years older than James, and her Upper Canada land petition record states she was married to John Dossie. And that fact bears up. It's also in the uh, 
Raleigh Township land records. I was stuck. I was stuck for months and months. I even talked to people like Linda Urquhart, who has researched the Dolsons extensively. She's from the Windsor University of Windsor. She's uh, done a whole Dolson genealogy. She's a very nice lady. Had the opportunity to meet her last year. Then I got anxious and I called in the pro genealogist to find both Mary Dolson and to help me with my McKinnon rocking. Don't get impatient. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, uh, the next slide, you'll see on the next slide the definitive piece of evidence that Colleen LeBay of this branch found for me. And it turns out that we're, co we're cousins because Colleen LeBay was born a Dolson. Uh, so I already connected the other dots by proving Samuel Newkirk. Incidentally, I was the first person to prove lineage lineage to Samuel Newkirk, so they were quite excited down at uh, the Bicentennial Group of the United Empire Loyalist Association of Canada. Interestingly, the, the pro-genealogists at Ancestry uh, said, well, when uh, they couldn't find Mary Dolson, they had identified an expert, Colleen. <laughs> and I say, well, that's wonderful. She's my cousin. She's already found the proof. And, uh, Thank you. No, I don't want your help anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a two for one deal because Isaac Dolson was married to George Steele's daughter, Mary. So there's another Mary Dolson. You can see the challenge is already in trying to find Mary Dolson. <laughs> but here's the piece of evidence from the Christian Guardian death records. Newkirk, Mrs. Wife of James Newkirk and daughter of Daniel and Abigail Dolson died recently at Chatham. Daniel Dolson was the son of Isaac Dolson, and Abigail Colburn was his wife. And that nailed it down. And he said, that's it. So it's another one you guys are eligible for. So this is from an excerpt from the historical notes on the Providence United Church, which is based in Raleigh. And here's a uh, Mary Dolson sitting right here where she's always been a few months before she died. There's her husband, James. Elizabeth Dolson is James' uh, sister, Elizabeth Newkirk, who was married to Ninian Holmes, the circuit writer preacher. Ninian Holmes died in 1829, and uh, Elizabeth Dolson married Daniel Dolson my great 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 grandfather in 1835 and he's sitting there and uh here's uh isaac dolson's wife mary she's sitting there amy dolson married uh daniel dolson jr amy dolson was elizabeth newkirk's daughter with ninian holmes so but an awful lot of research has gone into being able to sit here with a pointer and say this is who that is and that's who that is, but they've been there all the time. <laughs> and the end result, Isaac Dolson and George Field. I just picked these up last Saturday. <laughs> who were the loyalists? Isaac Dolson was born May 26, 1739 in Poughkeepsie, New York, died in 1812 in Raleigh Township. His son's Upper Canada land petition record says he died at the outset of the uh, War of 1812. So uh, I'm assuming it was 1812 because I have a copy of his will and it was uh, validated in 1813. So Isaac Dolson fought in the Seven Years' War under the command of Sir William Johnson. He fought at places like Lake George and Ticonderoga which uh, was named Fort Carillon or Carillon. Uh, it was French uh, until the French got uh, clobbered in 1759. And he also served under Colonel John Butler, brought him recruits. Some have credited him with being one of the founders of Queenston, Ontario. He didn't hang around very long. And he served as group spokesman on several occasions, which we'll see. Here he's uh, complaining to Colonel Butler about their situation at Niagara. 
that they can't own their own land, they have to sell their crops to uh, the fort. And if something's not done about it, they're all going to leave. So I guess something wasn't done because they left and went down to Detroit. And here's this grave that I found. And this is amazing. It was Isaac Dolson writing to the Honorable, or to the Land Board of Hess. And it says, Whereas the subscribers has formerly been plundered by the Indians who plants corn at and about the mouth of the River La Tronche and is making uh, preparations for continuing this summer. Uh, let me see. Uh, I have it written down here. Um, yes, making preparations for continuing this summer at the same place. The subscribers wanting to live in peace and quietness humbly praise that they Indians would be disposed of that liberty as government has bought and paid them for that land. What's interesting, this the sign the signatories of this note uh, reads like a who's who of early uh, Wally Township. You have Isaac Dolson, Hezekiah Wilcox, spelt with uh, two L's, which indicates he was a Quaker. We have Gaspar Brown over here. Even though Romantic Kent said when uh, Samuel Newkirk was killed by a fallen tree that uh, Elizabeth Newkirk went back to the Mohawk Valley. Elizabeth Newkirk, or Elizabeth Brown, is one of the signatories of this note. Why would she sign that if she was going back to the Mohawk Valley? The uh, government was handing out ration provisions, tools to these people until they could get their drugs until they could get uh, become self-sufficient you know so it's not that she wasn't getting any supplies personally I believe that Elizabeth Newkirk or Elizabeth Brown as she was born is the daughter of Gasper Brown and he was from North Carolina and that's going to be my fourth proof of a UEL but it's a work in progress this was an absolute treat to come across this. You know, you don't see this every day of the week. And here's Isaac Dolson talking about what I've already mentioned, how he fought in the Seven Years' War, uh, how he's a good uh, loyalist, came from uh, Pennsylvania where he lost all his land at the time of the American Revolution. And, uh, all this wonderful stuff, and would you please give me some land? I have all these kids, so the land board usually gave him uh, seven lots, 200 acres per lot. Three on the south side in Raleigh Township, four on the north side in Dover. George Field was born in 1721 in White Plains, New York, and died in 1785 in Niagara, Ontario. Also a member of Butler's Rangers and married to Rebecca Haynes. He occupied the lot next to his son-in-law, Isaac Dolson, in Niagara around 1783. George uh, Field stayed up there. Uh, the rest of them went south. Samuel Newkirk was born in 1761 in Ulster, New York, and also a member of Lieutenant Colonel John Butler's Rangers, Captain William Caldwell's company. He joined in 1780 and was discharged June 24, 1784. He was a loyalist, but his father, Garrett Newkirk, remained loyal to the American cause. So if I ever wanted to join the Sons of the American Revolution, I had to late, but I really don't want to do that. <laughs> they, may, they may have long memories and want to tar and feather me. <laughs> One of the battles that William Caldwell was in was the Battle of Blue Licks. It was the last battle the loyalists won. Interestingly, one of the uh, fighters on the other side was someone named Daniel Boone. <laughs> I remember watching that as a kid. Uh, I guess at that time I should have been cheering for the British. <laughs> and here's literally what it was like. You know, the, 
they lost their lands uh, and they had to just pull up stake and move to Canada. Mm -hmm. so, and that's the ring, uh, the uniform of the Butler's Rangers. Uh, they had a bad rap because they were blamed for a couple of massacres. So that's even further reason that I can't see why Elizabeth Brown would go back to upstate New York with the reputation that Butler's Rangers and her husband was a Butler's Ranger had. Now we're going to talk about the McKinnons. That's my great grandmother, Anna Radley, and my grandmother, uh, Annie Radley McKinnon. And, uh, And uh, first we'll go into family memorabilia, which uh, my cousins were able to provide me, and one of which was a note found in an envelope. And it talks about, it was signed by the Reverend who married uh, Donald McKinnon and Emma Radley. And we also have a listing of Radley grandchildren, and uh, I got some portraits from another cousin. Wonderful. So here's another one of these. Uh, this is uh, Samuel David Radley and his wife and all the children. Birth dates, dates they got married, dates they died. Emma's marriage date has been padded by one year compared to uh, uh, what's on the official records. And if you see these two red dots, one is for a person named Chester Alfred Lister, who uh, uh, Emma's uh, sister uh, Eleanor married uh, Charles Edmund Lister. And the other is for the birth of Annie Radley McKinnon, my, uh, my grandmother. And it's been padded by one year, and that's been padded by one year. And that's interesting because uh, well, here's the letter, a note in the letter that says this certifies that on the 22nd day of October 1885, the other page said 1886, I formed together in holy matrimony Donald A.W. McKinnon and Emma Radley, according to the bloody law, and the Reverend signed it. And uh, so uh, it's interesting that uh, whoever was writing down the dates for uh, the family uh, would pad just those. Except uh, when she realized that uh, my grandmother was born in January of 1886, and Emma Radley and Donald McKinnon were married in October of 1885, and Emma Radley's the daughter of a prominent Chatham citizen. <laughs> and it becomes not so hard to figure out why someone's <laughs> interested in padding records. Yeah. Well, the 1891 census shows Donald McKinnon, his wife, and the mother Catherine, two sisters, Rebecca and Caroline, living in Wallaceburg. Then after that, he's completely gone from Canadian records to start showing up in American records. Remember, at the start, I said my mother told me no one knew where Donald McKinnon the records place Donald McKinnon, his brother Albert, and Rebecca in Anaconda, Montana. Emma's not there. Now this is from the will of uh, Donald McKinnon's father, John McKinnon. And right down at the bottom, you see the AW that you saw in the note stands for Donald Archibald William McKinnon. So when you're handed a marker like this, yeah, you part with it because you don't get like there's no other Donald A. W. McKinnons out there anywhere. So, and he liked to use it a lot. So. <laughs> Here's the uh, Halton County Census record. As my mother said, from up near Toronto, they were Trafalgar County or Trafalgar Township of Halton County, which is present day Streetsville. And uh, this is after uh, John McKinnon had died. You can see the family. Oh, see the family. Catherine, uh, 
Sarah Ann, Albert Campbell, Maria Jane, Rebecca, Caroline, and Donald A.W. I know I got the right family. And then lo and behold, 1881, McKinnon, uh, D.A.W., down in Chatham. How or why he got here, I have no idea. But he was uh, farming. Uh, Lot 22 on Concession 11, Wally Township, and he was living on West Street. And Emma Radley was a couple blocks away at uh, McCroy and Richmond. So, motive and opportunity are all there. So, here's their official marriage record, and. Uh, 1885. One, uh, they uh, got married, then they uh, went to Minneapolis to give birth to their daughter. Uh, Emma's sister Eleanor and her husband uh, uh, Charles Lister were uh, living in Minneapolis. I'm assuming uh, Daddy was many times upset, and they were on the run, and uh, her sister. Uh, gave them uh, a safe haven. They had the uh, had uh, my grandmother, and then uh, they came back in 1887. I got that from a census record that shows my grandmother Im uh, immigrated to Canada in 1887. So, anyhow, this is what Donald this is what Donald was doing. He was an agricultural implement agent and grain dealer. Still doing the same thing uh, in uh, 1891. And here they are living in Wallaceburg, 1891. Here's Donald McKinnon. Interestingly, he puts his sister first, Rebecca, then his wife, Emma, then Carrie, who was Caroline, and his mother, Catherine. And my grandmother's nowhere to be found, I think. Maybe they had considerations for uh, the fact she was born in the States and hadn't been naturalized yet. I don't know. Maybe she was living with somebody else. I've not been able to find her census record. So, but I do know it's the right family. So then I decided to check out newspapers.com. And uh, I found out Anaconda, Montana had a newspaper the people running it were from Waldesburg. Uh, names are Kennedy and Burgess, which are fairly uh, well-known Waldesburg names. They were, uh, they were circulation editor, they had a variety of things. I determined a contributing reason for Donald leaving Emma. I found out Emma had, was having issues of her own, and this was from uh, the Chatham newspaper, but they never really know why Donald left, but it, it's a sad story. See, uh, Albert C., uh, which they spelled wrong, but, uh, Albert Campbell McKinnon, and the grocery firm Kinnon and McKay received the sad news of the probable fatal illness of his sister at her home in Wallaceburg. It is probable that Mr. McKinnon will go east to see her, and which he did, and he came back in July of 1892 by uh, February 93, uh, Caroline McKinnon died of tuberculosis. So that's supposedly the reason that the family uh, uh, left, you know, uh, as to why uh, they didn't take, why he didn't take his wife and child with him. I have no idea. Maybe he did, maybe he asked her, do you want to go? And she said, no, I don't want to go to Montana. I'm guessing here. So all I know is that's why they went. And back in Chatham, two and a half months later, Samuel David Bradley dies of tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. So these households were in turmoil. You know, so pretty obvious that uh, it wasn't just a I hate you kind of thing, you know. There was extenuating circumstances across the board here. 
So the McKibbins, though, uh, out in Montana, were uh, pretty well known. Have a business bio uh, which talks about Albert coming to Montana, 1883. It does say he was born in New York State, which is not true. But I think he was probably trying to foster an image for his business. To be honest with you. And when business turned bad in 1902, uh, uh, Albert and his brother, my great grandfather Donald, sold their business and they moved further west. This is how prominent Albert had become out in Anaconda, Montana, which is a mining town up in the mountains, close to the Idaho border. He bought himself a bicycle and was practicing to ride it, and it makes the newspaper. So <laughs> that, that's prominent. <laughs> so, and their sister Rebecca is. Uh, Tried to recover a loan she had made to uh, another woman, and this other woman was trying to get out of paying it, and uh, the judge sided with Rebecca. But it does mention Wallaceburg and about here where the pointer is, and uh, so you know again it's the right Rebecca. And, and actually, Rebecca went back to live with her sister Sarah Ann in Streetsville. And that's where she died in 1928. Here's my uh, great grandfather's death certificate from uh, Spokane, Washington. He was living in the uh, Davenport Hotel, which at one time was a showpiece, but by the time he died, it was a flea bitten, broken down hole. And uh, it has since been purchased and uh, restored and is uh, a showpiece of Spokane again. But, but it's got everything. It's, it's got his name, Donald Archibald William McKinnon, his date of birth, uh, where he was born, his father John McKinnon, his mother Catherine Wilkinson. The person who came to claim the body was his niece. And, uh, he she took it back to Anaconda, Montana. It all hangs together. The paper hangs together. That's what you got to do. Make the paper hang together. And you'll know within yourself when you've got it right. It just feels right. It's, I can't explain it any other way. You just know. It's the aha moment. You say, yes. My wife will tell you, yeah, he comes upstairs, he got a smile, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So. And it's that VAW that held this all together. He was christened Donald Archibald William. And that VAW is found in John McKinnon's letter of administration, Wallaceburg District Business Directory, note from family, state of Washington death certificate. 1861 Trafalgar Township Census and other places and allowed me to track him. So that's what became Donald McKinnon. As far as uh, being from Scottish Kings, I'm still working on that. But I, I, I tend to doubt it. I think my mother on that one was a little over exuberant. <laughs> I think she thought because you have the name McKinnon, you were part of the clan. And they even said, they even named me M-A-C K McKinnon, because they said that means that you're truly important Scottish, which we now know that whether it's M-A-C or M-C uh, doesn't matter. So. Now, and when she said uh, my great-grandmother's behavior wasn't much better, there's something on the next slide which is kind of interesting. Also, I add, why did neither Donald or Emma ever get remarried? They didn't. And maybe this, the uh, experience was so bad for both of them that uh, they said no. Was it tracking down the McKinnon Scottish origins is challenging, but I'm getting some results going through land records of Halton and Haldeman counties. There's some interesting stuff there. Where was Catherine Wilkinson from? You know, I paid a uh, pro genealogist to find that and they couldn't. And John McKinnon had a brother, Dougal Stewart McKinnon. I got that from John McKinnon's father's will that listed all his children. 
and it makes me wonder if there is a blood connection to the Stewarts. We all know the McKinnons supported the Stewarts in all three of the Jacobite uprisings, so it could just be they were commemorating the Stewarts, uh, memory-wise. So here's a marriage certificate for Chester Alfred Lister, that other person with the white or the red dot that I said whose birth date was padded. It lists the mother as Emma Ratner, when the mother's supposed to be Eleanor Ratner. Now, I personally, I think this is probably a mistake, but. Emma Radley belonged to Christ Anglican Church here in town, and this marriage is taking place at a Methodist church, quite possibly Park Street. But I still think, you know, the family being well known, I think whoever wrote that down just made a mistake. Because uh, in 19, or 1898, Eleanor had a daughter, and she named the daughter Emma. So I think if Emma had slept with her husband, she wouldn't have done that. <laughs> so, uh, so I, but this threw me for a loop the first time I saw it, you know, because I thought my grandmother was an only child. Mm -hmm. Here's this, you know, this has caused a lot of people on Ancestry to put down wrong information for Emma Radley. They think she's had more than one child. Yeah. And here's Catherine Wilkinson died of bronchitis yesterday morning at the family residence, 214 Hickory Street, which is where the McKinnons lived in Anaconda, the mother of Albert C. and Donald and Rebecca McKinnon. She was born 76 years ago in Glasgow, Scotland. She was a lowlander. Her husband was a highlander. You know, how times have changed, but that's supposedly a no-no to begin with. Secondly, the pro-genealogists are with Ancestry. Newspapers.com, where I got this from, is with Ancestry. Why couldn't they find this? So, another reason, only as a last resort, only if you're adopted or something, you know, go to the professionals. Because they're human beings, and to their credit, I, I misled them in what I was asking for. So uh, I was a lot to blame for uh, them not being able to find out what I wanted. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm happy because I got the opportunity to find it. Mm -hmm. Wow. So the learnings. Do not blindly follow ancestry treatments. As I said, you're going to go in the wrong direction because it's the prominent, the nobility, uh, the aristocrats who leave the paper, you know, they're the names you're going to come across. And they're often going to be the same as the names of your relatives because people name their children after prominent people. Don't be in a rush. This takes time, needs professionals only as a last resort. Establish a network and be prepared to help others if and when you're able. I have a number of people on Ancestry that I communicate with. They're all searching the same things I am, and it helps, yeah, because what you don't see, they might, or vice versa. Join. Join a genealogical society. You know, like Kent Genealogical <laughs> Society. There, there's a good one. Or uh, join a Facebook group. I belong to... Uh, the uh, Scottish Genealogy Facebook group. I belong to the Clan McKinnon Society, the United Empire Loyalist Association of Canada. So, and these people, these places have the resources you need to find what you're looking for. You know, and just stick with it. It's going to take you a while. Research the history of the areas where your ancestors may have lived. It's helped me out immensely. It's going to help me prove Gaspar Brown as my five-time great-grandfather, understanding the history of the movement from Niagara down to Detroit. So, you set up a family tree on a website. Uh, there's lots of 
Cindy mentioned the whole bunch. Some are free, uh, some you pay for. I use Ancestry, I pay a monthly fee. Uh, maybe I like the bells and whistles, I don't know. Check out the message boards we use. I found some good hints off the of message boards on Ancestry. Having a DNA test done can be helpful. Uh, especially if you can correlate your DNA matches to your tree. I have on Ancestry uh, almost 400 fourth to sixth cousins I found already. And the number of DNA matches with people like uh, Isaac Dolson up around 20 or 30. So, you know, the DNA evidence is there. Check, double check, cross check, go back and do it again periodically. That article I showed you on Catherine McKinnon, I didn't find the first time I went through, and that's when I panicked and called in pro genealogist. I just found that about three or four days ago. Because I went back and I checked. Get as much useful paper as you can regarding your ancestors. Uh, if I were to print it all out, it'd stand about yay high. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Someday I have to organize it. Mm -hmm. It's organized on my computer, and that's really all that matters to me. Fill in the entire families. Just don't go to grandparents, because you get hints from cousins, uncles, aunts. Uh, it's an online world, but only 15% of the records are online. They're adding more and more every day, but it's a huge task to sit down and microfilm and stuff. Sometimes you're going to need to travel somewhere. I've made two trips to the Toronto Reference Library already. Someday I'm going to have to go to Lake Pigeon, Michigan. I'm going to have to go up to Alderman County, because it's not all online. So. Make sure you organize what you're going for before you go, or you're going to waste a lot of time. And otherwise, thank you for attending. Here's a list of websites that I use. It's on the handout, so you don't have to copy it down. Are there any questions? Yes. <coughs> Border Patrol, or yeah, I know it wasn't, but how did they go so freely back and forth in Canada and in the United States? It seemed that way. Well, it was back then, uh, it was easier to go across the border. In this day and age, yeah, the, 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 every, everybody's worried about terrorists and bad people. There wasn't so much back then. Yes. Way, way back before the split, when the British were in charge, a lot of stuff was done out of Detroit. If you wanted to register something and you were from this area, you had to go to Detroit. Okay. And so they yeah. would go there and they could be able to go over freely. Yeah. And then from there they could venture on. They'd get in their little bateaus and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and Michigan was just a territory up until 1837. Just a territory. It wasn't a state until 1837. So uh, that was the yeah. In New York, the same. It seemed like the borders were very porous back then. It's not like that today. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. Was uh, Mayor Garnet Newkirk and his family, uh, which went to school with some of his children, he was a direct descendant of Samuel Newkirk, the same as you. Yes. About yeah, we, we, yeah they were, we can both claim them as a grandfather, yes. Hmm. Why did Victor Lorton change his name to Victor Lorton? Rumor has it he was trying to vex his father. <laughs> because his father wanted him to go into law and he uh, didn't like law. He went to law school for a while, but he didn't like law. He liked writing. So, and then it said that uh, he uh, didn't think uh, Park was a good enough name for a writer. So he came up with Victor Loriston. 
many had to officially change 1918. Bruce, I have an example of um, my folks are from Essex County, Leamington, that area. Yeah. Um, and a few of my great great grandfathers, they went across to Detroit to get married, just like you were mentioning. We couldn't figure out why until someone told me that was prestigious back in the day. So they would just, you know, go across the border if they were, you know, as a day trip. They would go across, get married, and come back and have a celebration. Just like maybe somebody here would run up to Niagara Falls to get married. But mm -hmm. that was, and then secondly, as you were speaking, I was saying, oh, I'm sure we all want your cousins because of all the stuff you were given. Um, but yeah. then you proceeded to talk about Wilkinson, who we are descended from, so I think we're your cousins too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So it sounds like they gave you an awful lot of really good stuff. You're lucky. I wouldn't be anywhere near really as far along, I don't think, without it. Yeah. And it's nice to see pictures of these people, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Oh. Are you related to a Blair McKinnon from the Windsor Star? He wrote for the Windsor Star. Yeah, I know. Oh, you lived in Blunt. Blair McKinnon, interesting man. He was told uh, my middle name, McKinnon, was uh, in honor of him. Oh. But he was just told that, that I, I was named after my grandmother. <laughs> yeah, very intelligent man. He was a poet, among other things. I have a copy of Tranquil and Kelp uh, yeah. at home. Wonderful poet, actually. And we really appreciate, we were talking about the Library and Archives website, and we and the things you were bringing up, I had said to Jill, oh, I haven't been on there for so long. I need to get back, I need to get back. And Jill said, that, that's very difficult sometimes to navigate. So I really appreciate you taking us there and showing us, you mm -hmm. know, those land records and petitions and where they were. So just a reminder to, as you said, go back and relook at things again. So that was, thank you for doing that. That was great. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Any other questions? Have you ever accessed any from England or Scotland? Just the, uh, the Wakefield Archives, which was fruitless, and the uh, Scottish uh, Genealogy Facebook page. It can be a little harsh on in there if uh, you kind of step out of line in their view, because <laughs> there's a lot of Americans, and Americans have one notion, and the Scots have another. <coughs> you know, it's kind of like going to Ireland. Uh, our, idea of Ireland is leprechauns and shamrocks, but when you get there, no, that's the uh, Hong Kong Irish concept. <laughs> <laughs> Same difference. So, and that's where, that's where I, in fact, that disclaimer I put on the McKinnons, that's exactly where it came from, the Scottish genealogy website. It stood me back. I was one of those people who thought, if you have the name McKinnon, you're part of the clan. Just not necessarily so. Well, on behalf of the branch, we have a little something for you. So thank you very much. That was really, really, really good. We really thank appreciate you. it. Thank I'm you. sure Rick will stay around, if you're, or the family. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to continue the family reunion. So thank you so much for that. And hopefully we'll see everybody next month. So yeah. grab some snacks and some coffee, and you're welcome to hang up for a